Following the last video on how loose substrate does not cause impaction in healthy animals with correct husbandry, which you will find in the same playlist as this video. The video promoted debate and discussion on social media, and some worthwhile points are being made. That's the whole point, encouraging discussion and promoting higher welfare standards. And in this video, we will discuss some of the valid points raised, and that's coming up. This channel is dedicated to improving reptile welfare with science and good information sources. If you want to stay up to date with good science-based care for your reptiles, then click the subscribe button and press the bell icon for future information. Now, I had a discussion with some of the members of the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry group about some of the good points raised, and I thought it was worth making a second video, building upon what I raised in the first video and what people raised in response to the first video. The evidence of wild habitat, points about animal welfare, and the mechanisms behind impaction can be found in the first video, and I'll link that in the top right of the video now. Many a point that was brought up was, how would you avoid bacteria build up on the soil? This is a very valid point. In other variums, unless we have a fully functioning bioactive system, this indeed can be an issue. And if the vivarium begins to smell in an enclosed space, this may actually have a negative olfactory effect on the animal, as well as pathogen and negative bacterial buildup. Another salient point is the concern over dust in the vivarium. As we shift into more enriching enclosures, focusing on choice-based care, providing the animal with options is or should be our priority. Now, there's this tendency for rigidity in how we classify in terms of terrestrial and arboreal, etc. For example, bearded dragons are regarded as terrestrial in the hobby, while the frilled lizard is deemed as arboreal. Even though the bearded dragon is known for climbing trees and other tall areas, seeking elevation. My point being, the animal has the option to climb and avoid substrate. It isn't always forced into permanent proximity with dust. It's when we think about how small our minimum recommendations, such as a 4x2x2 two two are, that we really start to think. An animal that is arguably semi arboreal by nature is forced into a space measuring only 2 feet tall. While we cannot ethically deny them the opportunity to dig, we surely cannot ethically deny them the opportunity to get off the subject either. It then becomes an issue of space. Dust may be an issue when the animal is forced into contact with a dusty substrate. We really need to reconsider what we as a hobby deem as ethical sized enclosures. This has inspired me to start a new build project on the biggest bearded dragon enclosure that I can possibly fit. The ventilation of our enclosures plays a massive part in reducing dust by drawing in fresh air. Thus by increasing our enclosure sizes, we can effectively plan for better ventilation and not be as restricted, especially when those enclosures are custom made. Excellent ventilation can reduce an excessive buildup of hot air. Ventilation at the top of the vivarium would allow excess hot air to rise and escape the viv. Larger vivariums may even include fans if we want to. So what can we do? While well, providing rocks and other chances to climb off the substrate, perhaps offering a loose substrate like we should and then placing rocks or slate sheets across two thirds of the enclosure and then allowing one third to be the substrate as well as allowing them to dig under the tile and burrow. Meaning even in a smaller substrate depth we can achieve burrow like conditions. We could even then lift up those tiles and spray underneath and make that substrate dam to recreate that microclimate of burrows like we have in the wild. And then also daily spraying down the enclosure reduces substrate's ability to become dry. If we're rinsing play sand thoroughly prior to using it, we can also reduce the risk of dust. Now, there are three main ways in keeping regarding to substrate. Number one, we have minimum substrate. The floor is composed largely of slate tile. This does in fact limit bacteria, but it also deprives natural behaviors. This can be alleviated by providing a tray of loose soil mixed with play sand, in the same way some keepers provide lay boxes. These can be large enough for the animal to engage in digging, while allowing that keeper to empty, disinfect and replace as they desire, thus limiting the risk of bacterial buildup. This is actually the way that I would keep during quarantine, to reduce how much I impair welfare, granted that I've actually had the all clear regarding parasites. Although, this doesn't allow the animal to shape its environment by digging burrows, therefore it isn't effective choice based care because they aren't actually crafting the environment themselves. Now the second way of keeping is what we can define as naturalistic, a substrate that allows digging etc and the opportunity to burrow, but there's also the opportunity to get off the substrate, as bacteria will indeed build up over time. It's important to do a full clean once a month on top of daily spot cleans. This is the way I'd been keeping before. As long as the animal is healthy, the risk of substrate impaction is not great enough for concern, as stated in the previous video, which you can find in the top right. This does allow the animal to shape its environment, providing ample opportunity to get off the substrate or climb is recommended. 
Finally, the final way is a fully bioactive system. This is a deep substrate with a humidity gradient of moisture at the bottom and dry at the top, locking in humid microclimates for custodian invertebrates to retreat to, and also allows the beardy to construct a burrow and access those microclimates too. This system is arguably the most time consuming and complex part of the three, but arguably the option with the most keeper enjoyment and welfare possibilities for the animal. Bacterial buildup is not an issue due to the self-cleaning nature of the bioactive environment, where soil microorganisms, custodians and plants work in tandem to deal with waste. Also, daily spraying of this reduces dustiness. It's worth noting that the risk of bacterial buildup may be worse in a smaller vivarium. If we think about the ratio of volume of substrate to the animal itself, if we think about it in terms of the carrying capacity of custodians and the ratio of soil to waste at any given time, the larger the vivarium, the less impact a large amount of feces at once would have, and that system would be able to deal with that, and the keeper could even spot clean that and remove that if they really wanted to. A larger enclosure all around should be sought. It should be our long term goal to keep pushing and inspiring for better welfare. Our ambitions regarding the quality of our care does not need to end with meeting the minimum requirements of the species, even if that is a 4x2x2 like I have. We must push past this. I believe we must shift our focus and excitement from the next animal and that collector mindset and focus on getting excited about the next enclosure for the animals that we do have. Even the keeper concerned with dust and bacteria can still utilise option 1 and offer some form of digging opportunity in a way that can be easily cleaned, even every other day should they wish, and progress through the other options when they can. The way of thinking that I'm so desperate to promote here is that it doesn't make you an awful keeper if you aren't keeping at option 3. It means that you're just at a different stage in your development in this hobby, and that's okay. Offering the correct information and gently encouraging and promoting keeper progression that they can be proud of is exactly what we're seeking here. We must be willing to adapt and change when new information comes to light. It's what makes us a responsible keeper. It takes maturity for us, including myself, to admit to ourselves that we didn't know everything and there is still much to learn when new information conflicts with what we thought was true. You can't be faulted for what stage you're at, as long as you're acknowledging the welfare implications of your current care and are actively pursuing adapting and taking new information on board for the benefit of our animals. It's the complete refusal of information and disregard of welfare by prioritising what's easy for us that stunts us as keepers. 